Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here in the, uh, I think first time I came to uh, Edinburgh uh, in uh, 2003 uh, for uh, almost 20 years ago for 75th birthday of McDonald. It was a very nice conference, which started my actual collaboration with Eric Reigns. Uh, it has a lot to do with this subject that I will talk about as well. So, uh, uh, so this is uh, going to be joint work with the uh, win who's here, and uh, my former student Daniel Thompson. Uh, and the topic is holonomic modules. Right. algebras. So, uh, as many of you know, uh, rational Kirinic algebras are uh, deformations, in fact, the most general deformations of. Uh, smash product of a finite group with differential operators on a vector space. And uh, for differential operators, we have a nice theory of D modules, uh, which includes theory of holonomic D modules. And this theory, one of the great things about it is it's very geometric. So it, uh, uh, you can define D modules not only on a vector space, but also on varieties. And uh, if you have a morphism of varieties to this morphism, you can attach functions of direct image and inverse image, and also direct and inverse image with compact support. There is something that's called formalism of six functors, and that's very useful in many fields. And so uh, the uh, goal of this work, uh, so this uh, is going to be described in our upcoming paper with Gwyn and Daniel, and uh, it re uh, extends uh, what was done in Daniel's thesis. Um, uh, so uh, this is an attempt to have such a geometric theory in this deformed situation. So when the deformation parameter is zero, we should recover the usual theory of Dimon. Okay, so let me start. So first of all, we have to put things on arbitrary varieties. And this was done in my paper in 2004. So I think I should start with recalling that. Uh, so X is going to be an uh, affine smooth. <clears throat> variety over the complex numbers. Everything is going to be over the complex numbers, but can actually be done over any field of characteristic zero. Uh, and uh, uh, let's say dimension of x equals d. Uh, so it's a pure dimension, but, it, uh, but, but there is no loss of generality if you assume that it is an active. Although this is not needed actually. Uh, and uh, uh, let's say D of X is the algebra of differential operators. Uh, on X. Then, uh, so uh, what are deformations? So we, I told you that uh, uh, Chirinic algebras are obtained by deforming a semi-direct product of a finite group with this algebra when X is a vector space. Uh, but for varieties, actually, even the group is trivial. If the group is trivial, we still have some non-trivial deformation. So let us discuss what they are. So what are <coughs> deformations of D of X? Well, this is a classical question. Uh, and it is answered by uh, the theory of twisted differential operators. So uh, how does this question, how do you solve this question for a general <coughs> associative algebra? Well, you just want to compute Hochschild cohomology. <coughs> and um, one can show uh, that this is, uh, there are many proofs of that. It's not difficult to show that this is the same as just cohomology of X. And in particular, this is true for two. So, so for, for example, for i equals two. So this, uh, this implies that, uh, so uh, first order deformations of an algebra are described by uh, second Hochschild cohomology. So we get the first order 
deformations uh, are uh, described by stepping homology of this is just cohomology as a as a topological space or the RAM cohomology for well, fine varieties these are the same things uh, as shown by Brot and D. Uh, the the Ramka homology meaning literally the homology of the algebraic the Ram complex and uh, okay so uh, in principle there could be uh, there is also third cohomology and uh, there could be obstructions to deformations in the third cohomology <clears throat> but in this case this doesn't happen so we can actually implement all of these by uh, uh, by actual deformations and this is called twisted differential operator so how to do it uh, uh, so uh, so can implement all of this and so to do that uh, uh, we should just fix uh, a representative here. Uh, so, uh, so classes here, like I said, are represented by uh, uh, a closed two form. So we fix this form, and then uh, we define uh, the algebra d omega of x as follows. So it is generated by uh, functions on x and vector fields on x uh, with the following defining relations. Uh, so first of all, uh, if you have two functions f and g, then the commutator is zero. So they commute. Also, uh, if you have f in OX and v in vector fields, uh, uh, so let's say it, um, I, I say that it's generated by vector fields of x, uh, but actually it's convenient to have notation when it's generated by d sub v, where v is in vector fields of x. So distinguish v from d sub v is convenient. Uh, so then, uh, if you take d of fv, it is equal to f times dv. Then uh, if you commute df, so uh, in the set, under the same assumption, if you commute dv with f, this is uh, uh, just going to be v of f in OX. So derivative of f along v. And finally, so these axioms do not use omega. The only axiom that uses omega is the last one. And the last axiom says that if you take the commutator of dv with dw, for ordinary differential operators, this is just d of Lie bracket of v with w. But here there is another term, which is omega of v w. And this is uh, in O of x. Omega is a two form and we can evaluate it on two vector fields. And so, uh, and so one can show uh, easily that, uh, so this has a filtration uh, defined by on generators by degree of OX is zero and degree of uh, this field is one. Uh, and uh, so that's an increasing filtration and can show that associated graded of D omega of x is naturally isomorphic to uh, uh, functions on the cotangent bundle of x uh, with, with the natural grading by the degree with respect to the momentum theory. Namely, uh, there is a natural map here, and this map uh, is obviously surjective, but actually, if omega is a closed form, it's an isomorphism. So this is the uh, poincare dergoff weed theorem. So again, you have a surjective map always, but it won't be injective unless form omega is closed. But if it is closed, then you can show that it's also injective. So it's an isomorphism. Uh, okay, and so this is the universal deformation, therefore, of D of X. Because it is easy to show that the class of this thing 
uh, in H2 is exactly the class of omega. Yes. Let me check the W or the omega of VW is killed by the by the was integrated. Yeah, the omega is killed and therefore it doesn't depend. Oh. There is something that is called twisted cotangent bundle. So actually, if you put a parameter in front of here and uh, tend it to infinity, uh, and uh, so uh, take associated graded combined with that limit, then you will recover something that's called twisted cotangent bundle, which is uh, basically means in this case that you take the standard symplectic structure here and add to it a form omega pulled back from X. But I'm not doing that. Okay, so uh, so that's a universal deformation. Well, norm, more precisely, universal deformation means that we have a formal deformation parameter, but these deformations make sense non-perturbatively, so for numerical values of deformation. So these are twisted differential operators on affine varieties. And now I want to consider uh, uh, a generalization of this. Ah, and maybe I should say that, uh, uh, this d omega is isomorphic to d omega prime uh, as a filter deformation of functions on cotangent bundle, if and only if uh, the difference omega minus omega prime is the exact, so the differential of some one form. Okay, so these are standard. And uh, so now uh, we want to, to, uh, to generalize. So what about uh, if you take G semi-direct product G of X, where G is a finite group. Uh, and so in this case, again, we need to calculate the second cohomology. And it can be calculated in a similar way. You can, in fact, you can calculate the homology of all degrees, but we are going to need only the second. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, so what this is going to be is this is going to be first of all the cohomology of X, as before, but only the invariant part. Mm -hmm. Well, because if we want to deform this equivariantly with respect to G, then omega needs to be G invariant. And then there is a sum uh, plus, uh, plus an E. And so I need to say what this E is. Uh, and uh, this E are corresponds to interesting deformations, which I would re um, I refer to as Chirinic deformations. So to say what this E is, uh, I want to uh, make the following uh, definition. So, so for every element G in G, let me look at the fixed points X sub G, set of fixed points. And it is easy to see that this is a, a smooth uh, sub variety of X, but maybe disconnected. and uh, with components of different dimension. If a group acts on a vector space linearly, then it will be connected. It will be just a uh, uh, subspace, but in general, it could be like that. And so we need to look at components. So, uh, and so we make the following definition. So definition, uh, a reflection hypersurface is a, a component of uh, XG. So, so uh, for G is a component of XG of core dimension one. So this is analog of reflection hyperplanes in the case of Cox's arrangements. Uh, 
and then uh, let S be the set of pairs G Y, where G is in G, and Y in X G is a reflection hypersurface. <coughs> Clearly, for this G has to be non-trivial because for trivial G, the, the entire X is a uh, fixed point. There is no reflection hypersurfaces. And there may be no reflection hypersurfaces at all. Like if you have minus identity acting on a two-dimensional space, uh, there won't be any reflection hypersurfaces. So that would be an empty set. Uh, and then, uh, so E is going to be just uh, functions on S invariant under G. So the group G acts on this by, acts by conjugation on itself, and it acts by permuting those hypersurfaces. And we can look at, this is a finite set, and uh, we look at functions invariant under G. Okay. And uh, uh, so then the theorem is that H2 is like that. And in fact, the, uh, uh, so I showed uh, the proposition, uh, which I proved in 2004, is that uh, all of these uh, first order deformations can be implemented uh, by actual deformations. So this means that uh, we can, uh, these are deformations. If you have formal parameter of deformation H bar, these are deformations modular H bar squared, but you can lift it modular H bar cube, H bar to the fourth and so on. Well, again, there could be the space H3 is not zero. So there could be obstructions. So you cannot prove this uh, easily by just pure deformation theory. And uh, the way to prove such things when you have possibility of obstruction is to, produce a deformation, produce a universal deformation. And this is what I did. Oh, sorry, does H3 also have a simple description? Yeah, it has a simple description, but, uh, but even in the case when the group is trivial, it is not zero. So, uh, uh, but it's, uh, this is, I'm not giving this description because it's not relevant. Uh, so we know what the deformations are corresponding to this. It's just turning on the omega parameter here. But then there is also a parameter here, which I will call C. And uh, what happens when you turn on that is uh, what is called Chirinic uh, algebra of order. So this is the next thing I'll explain. So are you checking the abstractions for each of these implementations as a family and just showing the advantage? No, 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 that you don't need to check because the, uh, uh, the family will already be defined as a deformation to all orders. <coughs> and so they automatically vanish. You have to show that it is. Yeah. yeah, you have to show that it's universal in the sense yeah, that yeah. Uh, the map from the uh, tangent uh, space to the deformation uh, uh, space to uh, H2 is an isomorph. And that's uh, easy to do. Uh, so, so I'll talk about orbifold Hickey algebras, orbifold maybe Chirinic algebras. Uh, so, uh, so, for, so do you find these algebras? So uh, there are two definitions of rational. So we want to mimic the definition of rational Chirinic algebras, but there are actually two definitions. One definition by generators and relations, and this is not convenient here because we do not have. We will see that we don't have some canonical generators. There, you to uh, choose generators, you will have to uh, make some ugly choices to choose a finite set of generators. These algebras are finitely generated, but to choose a finite set of generators, you have to make some ugly choices, and relations are not going to look, be nice looking in that case. And so, so you can do it, but it is not nice. So the second approach is better. And the second approach is this, the following, that you take differential. Uh, so to, you, when you want to define rational Chirinic algebra, you look at differential operators on uh, the regular part of your vector space, which is complement of reflection hyperplanes, takes mesh product with the group. Well, that algebra is too big, but then there is a subalgebra there, and you identify this subalgebra as one generated by certain sets. 
And there you don't have to write relations. You just write the set. So you don't have to have a nice system of generate. And that is the definition that I want to implement. And so to order, uh, so in order to, to do that, uh, I will uh, uh, consider the following geometric uh, uh, setup. So suppose Z in X is a uh, four dimension one uh, number, right? So there is no group. It's just, just sub, uh, sub variety for the moment. And we have a sheaf or X of Z. It's the sheaf of uh, regular functions on X with a at most first order pole at Z. Uh, so then uh, we have a sub sheaf of functions without poles inside this sheaf. And we can consider the quotient. Uh, which is a sheaf supported on Z. And that actually uh, is canonically isomorphic uh, to uh, the direct image. So, uh, so we, uh, let's say I is the map from Z to X embedding. So this is the direct image of the normal bundle of Z, the line bundle. So, uh, so the way to see it is that, uh, uh, well, there is a, uh, so if you take OX or Z over OX, there is a natural map to the tangent bundle restricted to Z, uh, which is uh, just, well, uh, so, so map to the tangent bundle is the same thing as a pairing with the cotangent bundle. Cotangent bundle is differential forms. And so if you have a function, with the first order pole and a differential form, you can multiply them and compute the residue. And that would be a function of Z on Z. So that means you have this map. And then this projects to the normal bundle. This normal bundle is a quotient uh, uh, the tangent bundle. X and Z, T, Z. Uh, uh, and uh, well, maybe I should say I, lower star. I is what I think it is, it's the embedding. Yes. Oh, yes, thank you. Okay, so we have this uh, kind of simple formalism. And now, uh, uh, so, uh, so this means that we have a map from vector fields of X. So, so this means that we have a map Xi. So this gives a map Xi from vector fields of X to uh, sections over X of OX of Z over OX. And because uh, X is affine, this is the same as sections over OX of Z over sections over OX. The section functor is exact. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, so in particular, this means that, uh, uh, so, okay, so, so this is a map that I need. And then uh, for every vector field V, so now fix a vector field V in vector fields on X. And uh, uh, let uh, uh, F V Z be uh, an element of uh, uh, Xi of V. So Xi of V is uh, so is here. So so it's a coset. And we take uh, an element of this coset, which means it's a, uh, uh, so if you have a vector field here, V, uh, then you can define a function with first order pole modular regular functions. And uh, you choose somehow that represent. Uh, 
And then uh, you define, uh, so I'm gonna define uh, the Dunkel Obdom operator. Uh, so G sub V, uh, uh, and this is gonna be, uh, so, so, uh, so this operator is gonna be inside G semi-direct product with D omega of X. So I'm gonna fix omega in close to form okay. invariant under G. Take the twisted differential operators and then I'm, uh, I, I'm going to, well, it's gonna be rational ones, which means I tensor up with field of functions on X. Uh, and but they're only going to have poles on on the reflection hypersurfaces, and so this dv is going to be partial of v plus the summation over uh, g and y in S uh, c g y uh, times f g y of x. <laughs> And times uh, uh, G minus. Actually, in the paper, there is a slightly different normalization uh, for this at C, but it doesn't matter for this presentation. So, uh, and then, uh, uh, so these are the these Dunkel uh, optum operators, <coughs> uh, and uh, and then you make the following definition. Uh, the, uh, the orbifold Chirinik algebra uh, H omega C of XG is the subalgebra uh, of uh, this G semi-direct product D omega of X rational generated by G by functions on X and various operators D sub V. Uh, well, you may ask, I made some ugly choice here, which I chose this representative. So how does it depend on that? And uh, well, in fact, this is well defined since uh, for every two uh, choices, F and F prime, if you take the Dunkel operator DVF, maybe I should write DVF here. Oh, sorry, also that's F, your F here is F sub V, Y? Oh, V, yes, thank you, I'm sorry. And the coefficient CGY comes from this element of E, I guess. That's correct, yes. That's correct. So DVF uh, minus DVF prime. Uh, so this uh, this actually happens to be a zeros order thing. So this, uh, and without poles, <laughs> poles for example, because the pole part is fixed. So this is in G, semi-direct product of OX. And so we already included these things. And this means that, in fact, this algebra is not going to depend on the choice. And uh, uh, so we have a map. So we have a filtration as before. A filtration uh, where degree of G is degree of OX is zero and degree of D, uh, V, G. DBF equals one. And we have a map. So if you take associated graded of this algebra, omega uh, C uh, of F. Well, this map surjectively a priori to semi direct product G with functions on T star X. And the theorem, uh, which I proved, which is the PBW theorem. Uh, that this is a, uh, actually no, in this case, there is a map 
uh, I believe that the, in this case, it is a map the other direction because it's a, uh, it's not generators and relations, it's a subalgebra, right? So we have a map the other direction, which is injective. And, uh, uh, and the PPW theorem says that this is an isomorphism. So in other words, if we had uh, just DVs, uh, then we would generate this algebra uh, G semi-direct product D omega of X without poles. And the claim is that when we make this deformation, this deformation is uh, kind of coherent in the sense that uh, we don't get too many operators. We don't get more than in the undeformed case. Uh, and, uh, what makes this tick? So uh, uh, the, usually uh, if you define Chirinic algebra in this way, then uh, you want to prove PBW theorem and that boils down to the fact that Dantel operations can be back. Yes. Could you repeat once more where these C, G, B, uh, Y come from, these coefficients? Yeah, this is in E. So, so there is a, a C, G, Y. So it's a function on these pairs, which is invariant under conjugation. One other question is, in your definition of that map psi from vector fields yeah. to functions, so for any given y, it only depends on the normal direction to y, right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, but somehow when you expected the algebra, the PBW theorem gives you something in all the whole cotangent bundle of x, I guess, right? That, that, that's right. So this pole part, so the pole is only uh, along the, the Y. That's right. And, and so, uh, I, I mean, so for example, like if you, uh, if you were in a vector space, uh, uh, then uh, you could take, uh, it's, it would be enough to take vector fields, which is just, uh, uh, you know, D over DXI, the li li constant vector fields. And then you could take the corresponding function to be one divided by alpha of x, where alpha is this linear function. And, and, uh, and then that would be the usual conclusion. So, uh, and, uh, and so uh, the Dunkel operators commute. So this is the effect that makes this proof work. And so how he, here they are not going to commute because we have this choice. But what is true is that if you compute the commutator dvf with dwf and you subtract dvwf, uh, mm -hmm. let's say f prime, uh, like f1, and here is going to be f2 and dwf3. This is going to be in G semi-direct product OIS. So th this shows that this, uh, this is really, you know, for, for our, th this is as good as them, they can use. Okay, so, uh, uh, and so the theorem, another theorem is that this uh, uh, H uh, omega C, of xg is a universal deformation of uh, the same direct product dx. <clears throat> so this is what I proved in, in 2004. Uh, and uh, uh, so then uh, let me describe what happens when x is not applied. So there are two small changes that you have to make. So if, if X is not a fine, not necessarily a fine, there are two things. The first of all, uh, the twisting for differential operators will uh, not be in H2 anymore, but it will be in uh, this uh, balance on Bernstein space of twistings for differential operator algebras on X. So omega is going to be, this is hypercohomology H2 of uh, the complex 
of one forms mapping to close two forms. So you take this complex of shifts and you compute its hyper cohomology, second hyper cohomology. And this, uh, uh, so Bellinson and Bernstein showed uh, in, the, in the paper proof of Janssen's conjecture, uh, showed that this parameterizes twisted differential operator algebras on S. Uh, in the case when X is affine, this, uh, there is no need to, uh, uh, to take, uh, uh, so, so, so in the case when X is affine, there is no need to take hyper cohomology. So uh, this cohomology will be in degree two and it will be just H2 of X. But for example, if X is a projective variety, then, uh, then actually it's gonna be H11 of X. Uh, and the second change is that we get not an algebra. Well, uh, this D, o, D of X already is not an algebra. It's a sheaf. It's a quasi-coherent sheaf of algebras. So we get a quasi-coherent sheaf of algebras, H omega C of XG. And uh, you just do, uh, you cover uh, it uh, by, uh, uh, open a fine open set and uh, construct this algebra. Well, there is a little subtlety here that uh, so warning that uh, in this case the quotient space H over G may not be a scheme, and this may create some 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 issues. But uh, uh, but on, so it's only an algebraic space. Uh, and uh, this is a shift on X over G. Uh, but but this is not uh, important and uh, you can uh, uh, kind of uh, do this, this generality. Okay, but in, and also in all examples of interest, it will actually be a scheme, so it's okay. Uh, I didn't quite wonder, why did you say for a projective variety you only get H11? Is that obvious? Uh, what what happened to H zero mega two? No, no. Uh, for uh, sorry, mm. for projective uh, variety, uh, it will be more complicated than that. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 uh, no, no. Uh, it's in. Uh, yeah. Maybe for projective space or things like that, that's ages. Yeah. I, I wanted to say sorry. Uh, so, uh, and so here are examples of this algebra. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, uh, suppose X is a vector space and G acts linearly. Uh, so in this case, uh, this omega is going to be zero uh, and this H uh, C of X G is what is called the rational unique algebra. There is normally also a parameter T that is put in, but in this uh, talk, T is equal to one. So I'm not considering the classic algebraic algebra, which is the big center here. Uh, and then the second example is when X is a torus and uh, G acts by uh, also linearly, then still omega is zero. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, not necessarily, 
zero, but let's take omega is zero. And then uh, we'll get uh, HC of XG is a trigonometric uh, Chirinic algebra. Omega will automatically be zero if uh, this is a maximal torus of semi-simple group and the G is the Weyl group. Because uh, re recall that it lies in the invariance of the second cohomology, and second cohomology is wedge two of the reflection representation, which has no invariance. And the third example is when X uh, is uh, abelian variety uh, and, and G acts linearly, which means that uh, G is a complex crystallographic reflection group. Complex, uh, well, uh, only the part of G generated by reflections is important. Uh, so, so actually, uh, it's easy to see that everything here reduces to the subgroup which are, uh, of elements which do have reflection hypersurfaces, which is a normal subgroup in our group. Everything else is just obtained by tensoring up with the group. And so, uh, uh, so this is going to be uh, such groups if this is generated by its reflections will be a complex crystallographic reflection group. Hmm? As in pop-up? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, uh, and G acts linearly. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, this H. In this case, it is reasonable to put omega because we're already going to have even in the in, 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 in interesting cases some invariance. Uh, uh, this is a what, what is called the elliptic Chirinic algebra, and this is uh, discussed in. Uh, our in, in a number of papers, in particular in my paper with uh, uh, Felder, uh, Sasha Vesilov, uh, and uh, Okay, so these are the examples, but there's certainly other examples. And now I want to talk about holonomic modules. Uh, so are there any questions up to this point? Okay. When, uh, but this, this question about commutativity of the generalized local operators, uh, do you have other cases where this happens? Uh, I find the cases except for Shining algebra. Yeah, so, so the, to get, uh, uh, so, I mean, this kind of commutativity, like weak commutativity, let me call it, uh, happens always in general. But it's not strong commutativity because have some nice general operators that actually strongly commute. Uh, this uh, happens, uh, well, in these cases, it does happen, but already in this case, it is somewhat non trivial. Uh, so uh, it's uh, these operators are not. They have a kind of monodromy around cycles. So you can write them, but not quite in this setting. So. But in the rational case, the double operators actually commute, right? Yes. yes. And also in the trigonometric case, they actually commute. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, it's also, yeah. They, they actually commute, but already in the trigonometric case, there is a slight problem that they are not W in uh, stable. Together with the Weyl group, they generate what is called the degenerate uh, affine HK algebra. Uh, but but actually in the elliptic case it isn't even hard to write down you cannot even literally write down commuting ones but you can if you relax the condition of double periodicity uh, along the periods of elliptic curve sorry, maybe one last just like we just said about the g's that contribute so if, if you have a g that doesn't fix the hyperplane then it doesn't contribute to this that's right all. Yeah, then it doesn't contribute so in particular, if you have a G that uh, a group that does not have any reflection hyperplanes, then this deformation is trivial. There is no E, E is zero, and there is nothing interesting going on. Okay, other questions? All right, so let me talk now about holonomic modules. Uh, so, uh, so for uh, algebras of differential operators and uh, also twisted differential operators, we have 
uh, nice theory of uh, holonomic modules, holonomic D modules. And uh, so, uh, uh, and we want to, uh, so there are some formalism of six functors which we want to generalize. Uh, but uh, one of the important notions in this theory is, uh, which is allows you to define holonomic modules, for example, is the notion of singular support. So, uh, so suppose M is a finally, uh, well, so coherent uh, D uh, omega module. Uh, so this means locally finally generated. And uh, so in this case, we can consider a uh, good filtration, then it has a good filtration. Uh, which means that the associated graded is also going to be finally generated over the associated graded algebra. Uh, and so, uh, so get a coherent uh, G semi-direct product for, of T star X module, your M, uh, let me call it F. It depends on the filtration. And so this means uh, this, this is just a G equivariant coherent sheaf on T star X. And we can take its support. So the singular support of X is a singular support. Well, it's just the, the support of uh, this GER FM. So it's a closed subvariety in uh, T star X. Uh, uh, and this is uh, actually there is no G in this case, sorry. So I not, don't need to say G equivariant. So because this is just a classical story. Coherent sheaf has singular support. Uh, so this is a closed subvariety. And this is independent. It is well known that this is independent of the choice of F. And uh, there is Goddard theorem, which is that uh, the singular support of M uh, is co-isotropic, which means that the uh, tangent space uh, at every point is a co-isotropic subspace in the tangent space of T star. X, which is a symplectic vector space. Uh, and, and then uh, one uh, calls uh, a D-module holonomic when this, this is Lagrangian. So poisotropic subvariety has dimension at least half of the dimension of T star X, or at least the dimension of X. And if it is exactly that for all components, which is the smallest it can be, then the symplectic form vanishes on this subvariety, and it is Lagrangian. And that is what is called holonomic. So holonomic modules, d omega modules, are those for which singular support is Lagrangian. And uh, there is an alternative definition. <laughs> it is using uh, Gelfand Kirillov dimension. Uh, let's say for X sub Y. But you can easily extend it to non affine by looking at local charts. Uh, so. Uh, so, so one can show that, uh, so there is Bernstein inequality, which is a weak form of this uh, Gabber theorem, and which says that the gelfand kirillov dimension of Rose dimension of M is at least a uh, dimension of X. No, and, and at most uh, two dimension of X, but that's trivial. Uh, and this is the Bernstein inequality. Uh, and 
m is holonomic, not equal to zero. Uh, so maybe I should say uh, holonomic d modules, uh, non zero d modules are defined by the condition that this is Lagrangian, but zero is also regarded as holonomic. And so m not equal to zero. Uh, so this inequality holds for m not equal to zero, and m not equal to zero is holonomic if it is exactly equal. And these definitions are equivalent. So in the case of uh, uh, Chirinic algebras, uh, this works uh, for generic uh, C for which this algebra is simple. So it is simple, obviously, for C equal to zero because it's a smash product of, uh, um, so I'm going to assume that the group acts, uh, uh, so, so let's say, uh, maybe uh, uh, simple or direct sum of simple. Anyway, let, let's assume for simplicity that the group acts uh, transitively. Uh, sorry, so the, the group acts freely, generically freely. So in this case, uh, the smash product G with G of X is simple. Uh, what is generically? It means that if you take generic point of X, then uh, it's trivial stabilizing. Uh, and uh, then uh, the, the, for generic C, one can show that this algebra is still simple, but for special values of C, it has non-trivial ideals. And when it has non-trivial ideals, this uh, will fail. So it fails for special C. Uh, and in particular, we can have finite dimensional representations of rational Chirinic algebras. And we want to include those special C, so we need to have a definition that uh, 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 captures them. So finite dimensional representation will have a support which is zero, uh, which is definitely not quasi-trophic, and uh, it has gelfand kirillov dimension zero, which is less than the dimension of X. So we want to have a definition that captures that, and uh, this is done in the paper by Losev, so Losev uh, has a paper which is called holonomic Bernstein inequality and holonomic modules. <clears throat> uh, and uh, he uh, actually uh, uh, generalized both approaches. Uh, so, uh, so one uh, approach is uh, how to generalize the condition of quasi And so in this case, uh, we really need to uh, look at not a T star X, but T, our algebra are sheaves on T star X over G. And uh, so uh, the correct thing to look at is we look at a singular support of a module uh, lying in uh, T star X over G. Uh, and in this case, this is not a symplectic variety, but it is, uh, it's a, it's almost one in the sense that it has uh, a Poisson structure uh, with finitely many symplectic leaves and generically symplectic. So it's Poisson, finitely many leaves. And these leaves are very easy to describe in this case, and they correspond to reflection. Uh, hyper surfaces. Uh, well, um, strictly speaking, Losev did it in the case when uh, fundamental groups of these uh, reflection hypersurfaces are finite. But this is not actually uh, not really important for what I'm going to say now. Uh, so, uh, 
so 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 then uh, the <coughs> uh, uh, so uh, it's a variety. Uh, X uh, or Z inside uh, t, uh, t star X over G is isotropic. So actually, Lagrangian is the same as both isotropic and co isotropic. So, in particular, we could have said the definition is that singular support is isotropic, means holonomic, because it is quasi-tropic automatically in the classical case by uh, uh, Gaber. And so, uh, so here it turns out that isotropic is an easier thing to work with. So we say that it is isotropic if it's intersection with every symplectic leaf. is uh, isotropic. And uh, 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 M is holonomic if singular support of M is isotropic. Well, let's say not, yeah. So that turns out to be the right thing. And uh, actually uh, the way this came up, so, uh, uh, in 2013, uh, Bernstein, about 10 years ago, Bernstein uh, asked during his talk uh, uh, the, uh, the following question. Uh, so we have the localization theorem, which says that there is an equivalence of categories between representations of uh, uh, Lie algebra, semi-simple Lie algebra G for zero central character and uh, D modules on the flag manifold. Uh, then for D modules on the flag manifold, there are nice subcategory, which is holonomic D module. And he asked how to tell if the corresponding module of the enveloping algebra, uh, how, how, how to see holonomicity for the module over the enveloping algebra. And the answer is, it turns out to, it's written in our appendix to this paper. Uh, so we wrote an appendix for, to this paper of Losev, where it is explained that that happens exactly when singular support of this module in the nilpotent cone intersects isotropically with every leaf, with every orbit. And so that's, uh, that's where this definition came. And, uh, and so this uh, is the right definition. And then there is also uh, uh, a version uh, with galfan kirillov dimension, well, I said Bernstein inequality in the uh, uh, classical formulation fails for special values of C. Uh, but uh, but one can uh, still restore it by considering quotients by the annihilators. So Losev proved uh, a theorem uh, that. Uh, uh, the gelfand kirillov dimension of M, when M is non-zero, is greater or equal than a half of the gelfand kirillov dimension of H by the annihilator of M. So I said that H is no longer necessarily simple, so there is an annihilator. And this quotient is a uh, algebra that lives on some closure or some... Uh, Union of some closures of some symplectic leaves. So it's even, Gelfand Kirillov dimension is even, and Gelfand Kirillov dimension of M is at least that. Uh, so, so this is a generalized Bernstein inequality. And then one can, one can say that holonomic D module, holonomic H module, is one with equality. Or uh, or the zero module uh, for simple. Uh, sorry, uh, holonomic simple H module. Because in this case, what can happen is you can have simple modules uh, with different. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, 
dimensions, and so you have to be careful with them. All right, so this is the category of holonomic modules. Uh, and uh, so what we did is uh, we, uh, we tried to uh, make some geometrical uh, uh, theory uh, of that. Uh, I can ask, sir, yes. yes. So when I have the in, in the second definition, if I have the, the equality, I guess that it's holonomic and then also simple. So it's. No, 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 no. Uh, you don't get that it is simple, but uh, but the, uh, the another definition of holonomic is uh, for simple modules in terms of this thing. But uh, for non-simple, it is a bit more uh, tricky uh, because uh, you see, you can take a, a module with a trivial annihilator, uh, then it will have a gelfand kirill of dimension equal to dimension of X, which is for holonomic. But then you can add to it uh, some non-holonomic module living, uh, but with a bigger annihilator. And that will still satisfy this inequality. So this definition is not correct uh, if, you, uh, if you just uh, use it for non-simple module. But, uh, but luckily there is, a, so uh, in the if you use the first, so so far we, we should use the first definition and, and then there is a theorem of Lossif, which is uh, that uh, holonomic modules uh, have finite length. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is similar to the D module situation. And then we can also use this definition, which is set that this is what a simple holonomic module is. And a general holonomic module is a finite length module whose all successive portions are holonomic. So this is actually Lossier. Well, again, he had some assumptions which uh, can be re relaxed, but it's not so important. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so yeah, so, for, so examples of holonomic modules include that, uh, first of all, category O for uh, rational and trigonometric case. So these are classical modules. And say, uh, so any uh, uh, O-coherent module. So if you have an O-coherent module, its singular support is contained in X over G, and then you can see that the intersection of that is isotropic with every leaf. So, uh, but it's not true that any O coherent module uh, is uh, uh, like in the D module theory, there is a story that it's a vector bundle with a flat connection. In particular, if it's non zero, it has to be supported on the entire X. That's not going to be the case here anymore for special values of C. And uh, so here is uh, some of our results in the geometric theory of D modules. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, 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 homological dimension of, uh, of the algebra H is 2D, where D is the dimension of X. Well, uh, that's easy to show. And, uh, and so if you look at uh, M and N, uh, any uh, H modules, then we have X groups. And they're going to vanish when i is bigger than 2d. Well, that's clear. But the theorem is that uh, for any i less than or equal than 2d, uh, or for any i actually, uh, x i. So if m and n are holonomic, then x i from m to n is finite dimension. So that's a one result. Uh, uh, and uh, so, uh, so maybe uh, another uh, thing is uh, the following. To what kind of geometric results we can prove. So one uh, 
fundamental thing is uh, uh, that uh, these uh, functors of direct image. So, uh, and the most important direct image functors, uh, one of the most important kind of direct image functors corresponds to open embeddings. So actually, uh, uh, when you consider morphisms between varieties with a G action, it will be in order to define the corresponding functors for the algebras H for the orbifold Cherenik algebras. These maps have to be in some sense compatible with the hyper reflection hypersurfaces. And this is what we call uh, Melis maps. And so, as far as I know, this is a Welsh word. Is this right? For something good, yes? Sweet, yes. So, uh, and uh, so this was introduced in, in your paper with. Uh, with Martino. With Martino, that's right. So, uh, but open embeddings are always that way. And so, uh, so we suppose you have a GA X circle into X open embedding, which is GA covariant, just open set, which is GA covariant. Well, in this case, first of all, we have a functor of pullback uh, from uh, uh, age of, uh, I will not write, G will be the same in both cases and parameters will also correspond. So I will say just H of X modules to H of X circle modules. And uh, this is just restriction. So this is a very trivial kind of functor. It is exact. Of course, it's also the same as this. Uh, it's just tensoring. Uh, with this thing, which is a localization of this locally. Uh, uh, so, uh, but uh, there is an adjoint functor. So uh, uh, there is a right adjoint. Is J lower star. Uh, and this is from A of H circle modules to H of X modules. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so this is the left exact. And this is simply a restriction. I mean, in an affine setting, it's just restriction uh, uh, to the subalgebra. So we have uh, algebra uh, with possible poles on the complement of X0, and we restrict to the subalgebra, which is, uh, has no poles. But of course, if X star in X is not affine, this functor is not exact and has higher commutation. So this functor is the same, but uh, then uh, the result in the theory of D modules, which is not completely trivial, and actually it's a kind of one, maybe the first non-trivial theorem in the theory of D modules, is that uh, this J lower star maps holonomic modules to holonomic. So uh, of course it is obvious for this functor, but for this functor it is uh, not obvious, and uh, this is our one of our main results. Uh, so the, there are many proofs of this, and some proofs uh, like Bernstein proof don't work quite well because they are based on this Bernstein quality, and other proofs uh, using the Kashivara site of filtration is the one that we use. Uh, and uh, so what else uh, we can say? So there is a uh, also. Uh, so you can look at uh, J star shriek. And um, oh, this is a, a submodule in uh, J star in the zero cohomology of J star M, uh, which is just uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> maximal. Uh, so, so, so this is the maximal one so that Walsh is supported on the x minus x zero. Uh, and uh, and so uh, if M is, so this module has no subs or quotients supported on x minus x zero. So this has already uh, no subs 
supported on x minus x zero, but this thing has no subs or quotients. You can also define the J lower shriek for holonomic. This is for holonomic model. Where is holonomic? And you can define J lower shriek and the uh, image of J lower shriek and J lower star. Uh, so, uh, and so this is, if M is simple, then J shriek star M is simple. Uh, and, uh, and so this is what the reducible extension, the Goreski McPherson extension. Uh, and uh, this allows us to classify. I'm not going to describe it in detail because I don't have time anymore. So it leads to a classification of irreducible holonomic modules. So it's a nice thing because in general for algebras of this type, it is hard to classify reducible modules. But for example, like for example, suppose you have uh, what are irreducible modules over the Weyl algebra in one variable. Okay, so you know from the point of view of non-commutative algebra, it's kind of crazy problem. But the point of view of geometric theory of the modules, you can actually say something. So you can say that these modules are uh, these extensions of modules living on some open part. And on the open part, you just have a differential equation. So you write differential equation with rational coefficients and all of them are obtained in this way. So uh, you can classify in this way also uh, irreducible modules for Lie algebra SL2. Uh, because in that case, every reducible module is holonomic. That's no longer true for bigger algebras. But, uh, uh, and so uh, you can generalize this. So they come from, from uh, extensions, street star extension from uh, well, coherent module. On uh, some open subset uh, of, a, of a, not open subset, or coherent uh, module on some, uh, maybe not open, but locally closed subset. So this is the same as in the D-module theory. Uh, but what is not the same, what is more complicated, is what kind of co-coherent modules you can have on these subsets. And uh, these are, uh, uh, so uh, what, uh, like an example uh, uh, is that, okay, so you have Kashivara's theorem, but it's not true in all cases. It's only true for those Nellis in embed. And uh, so in particular, this uh, gives rise to the fact that there are more interesting things here uh, ju uh, then just uh, uh, bundles with a flat connection. So uh, more precisely, you can have a, a more coherent module, which looks like this. It, it gives you bundles with a flat connection along some sub-variety, but in the normal direction, it looks like a representation, finite dimensional representation of the rational Cherenian culture. And uh, when you have, so th these things arise, you, you, the first time they arose is in our work with Bezru Kavnikov, which is called parabolic reduction and restriction functors for rational Chirinik algebra. So when you induce parabolically from a rational Chirinik algebra with smaller rank to a larger rank, and then you get structures of this sort. So, uh, but <laughs> up to that change, essentially, uh, the theory of classification of irreducible holonomic modules extends. And uh, also, maybe I should finish, but also uh, what we extended is uh, the theory of B functions. So uh, uh, the theory of Bernstein's theorem that every polynomial has a B function. So if you take polynomial to power S, there is a differential operator polynomially depending on S with regular coefficients, which maps it to, to P to the S minus one, but with some coefficient, which is polynomial of S. And the minimal degree polynomial of S with that property is called the B function. And the same is true here. So instead of differential operators, we can use uh, 
Dunkel differential operators, which means that instead of derivatives, they have Dunkel operators. And so you can define this notion. We don't know how to compute them very well yet, but yeah, hopefully they're nice. In examples, they turn out to be nice. Uh, and uh, there is also uh, the duality functor, but again, there is a complication having to do with, uh, with this that uh, on the category of holonomic module where the duality functor is exact and doesn't create higher cohomology, there is no such luxury in the special value case for Chirinic algebras. It's only going to act on the derived category. Nevertheless, it's going to square to one, and we can define uh, using this uh, also direct images. Uh, with lower shriek and upper star by conjugating the usual direct and low inverse images by D, by this duality functor. So we have kind of formalism of six functors, but it's incomplete in the sense that it's not for all maps. And um, so, uh, but maybe uh, at some point we will have as, as complete version as it should be somehow. And um, there are some uh, nice applications of this. For example, if you take over rational Chirinic algebra, and you take functions on the regular set. This is a finite length module over the rational Chirinic algebra. That's not a completely trivial statement. And there are similar generalizations of this state. What is H here again? Well, if you have a reflection group acting on a, some space H, let's say Cartan subalgebra or Lie algebra, let's delete the hyperplanes and take regular function. Well, that's a module over Chirinic algebra. And the claim is if you take more, is, this is a, is a module over differential operators. This is a finite length module, and that's not a completely trivial statement. And computing this length is not completely trivial. And for Chirinic algebra, it's also true, even for special values of C. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>